courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames were back to playing a fairly normal schedule of three games a week. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss those three games. Matt, let's start at the top of this week. Uh, the Calgary Flames actually set a record to start this week. The most shots ever recorded by a visiting team since the league started tracking shots in the 50s was 62 shots. Yeah, it, it was an okay performance. You that know, was like, against the Blue Jackets. Yeah, it, it's one of those that, you know, like it, if they had counted posts as well as four shots, I think the Flames probably would have had 68 or 69 shots on that because they came close a number of times on top of scoring uh, six goals. So, you know, it, it, it was an okay performance. Like, you know, there, there's been – and we even talked about earlier this season that we thought the Flames may struggle to get some uh, goals this year, some secondary scoring, but they're obviously not struggling to get shot, pucks on net. I mean, we saw a 7-1 victory uh, last week to the to the Blues. We're seeing a 6 nothing victory here. Like, these guys are starting to at least get the shots they need. Yeah, and Elvis Merlitzkins, uh became the first goalie in NHL history to surrender six goals – and have a 900 save percentage in that game. That's a crazy game. Well, as we mentioned, the Calgary Flames were visiting uh, Columbus, and they ended up winning 6 nothing in this game. Goals from Backlund, Mangiapane, Kachuk, Lindholm, Good Branson, his first of the year, and Kachuk again. Um, I would say... I don't know. I, this was a very dominant Flames win. I mean, even when I look at you know numbers in the face-off circle, the Flames won almost 85% of the face-offs in the first and 62 shots is the most ever recorded by an away team, which we talked about. Like what stat did the flames not own in this game? Um, saves by a goaltender. <laughs> That's about it. Like the, yeah, it was just complete and utter domination. Like Columbus didn't really have any pushback. Like they had a decent enough start to the game, but uh, like once the Flames broke the goose egg, it, that was basically it for them all night. You predicted a win in this one. Did you expect this dominant of a win? Uh, pretty much, because uh, Columbus is bad and they've been doing bad lately. So it's like the Flames really should have beat them. I was not expecting them to, you know, pants them, basically. As they did, like that. This was an embarrassing loss, and you know, the last time somebody had sixty-two shots was like ninety-one, so or something I, like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think this is the most ever recorded by an away team, but yeah, there's probably something like that for a home team. Yeah, it was the eleventh uh, highest amount of shots in NHL wow. history, but yeah, um, it just uh, like overall, just a really one-sided affair like the other team just simply did not have anything and even when they tried to do anything like the flames quickly neutered that and then turned it back the other way and just kept running over them and the next night the flames and blues played a rematch of that 7-1 flames victory here in the Saldome, dome but this time they played it in st louis what's their arena now the enterprise center I have no idea. I don't know. It doesn't uh, matter. Um, I, I still think of it as the Scott Trade Center. Me too. And it's like, yeah, I can't okay. keep track of all the name changes. Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah. I still call it the Sky Dome for the Jays. Like, who cares? <laughs> and and you'll still be calling the Calgary Event Center the Saddle Dome. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Flames even, didn't... It, it, honestly, even the new building, even if it doesn't look like a saddle, it'll be the well, saddle. that's what I mean, because... yeah. The, Just the, because the other dome, yeah, the um, non-dome dome. Whatever they call the rink, the Flames were there on the twenty seventh, and this was the second night of a back to back, and didn't fare as well as the first meeting. This was a five to one Blues victory. Um, I thought, and I had in my notes here. I thought that Backland had a great night. He got the one Flames goal, but I thought he was doing everything right in this game. Yeah. Uh frankly like this is one of those times the 5-1 score does not really indicate the level of play no i thought it was a good flames effort yeah like it seemed like basically every 
quality chance that St. Louis got ended up in the net. And I can't fault Markstrom really on any of the plays. It's just one of those nights where, you know, they right plays right time for each of their chances, and you know Calgary just couldn't get the right finish. Yeah, like it, like the Blues if, took uh, advantage of their opportunities better than the Flames did. Yeah, like in the first period when it was one one, if Kachuk scores on that two on one. Uh, the, you know, like the the game's a completely different outcome, and uh, it, it just seemed that like as Huso got more and more comfortable making more and more excellent saves, the Flames just kind of got frustrated and were trying a little too hard at times instead of just doing the simple things in the offensive zone, and it just kind of got away from them more and more as the game went along. I agree. Yeah, and I think, you know, as much as the Blues only scored one power play goal, I think the Flames took too many penalties here, and it sort of messed up the the flow and the ice time for their lineup. Yep. And then the Calgary Flames came back to Calgary for Hockey Night in Canada. This was last night as we record. And uh, I had to check my calendar a few times, see if I was watching preseason hockey or not, because this was not a very good game. Um, a score aside, we were. When's the last time you can remember that we had a zero-zero score after sixty minutes? Well, this was a case where one team showed up to play, and were sloppy at times despite showing up, and only one guy got the memo on the other team that there was a game on, and like that was probably the most pathetic effort I've seen from any team at any point in any season. So just to like, clarify for everybody, which team do you think showed up? Uh, the Flames, I thought, showed up. Vancouver, that was an embarrassment, frankly, for them. Their goaltender was good. That that was literally the only guy who showed up to play. Everybody else was, like, it, it, that performance, frankly, is bag skate worthy. Like, that's how bad. Like, it... Like, the, they didn't have a single scoring chance, really, in the whole game. I don't even know if I'd say the Flames showed up in this one, though. I think the Flames... They were sloppy uh, yeah, at times. It was definitely not the best Flames game we've seen. I mean, even after the first, the shots were 7-1. to one. Um, I, I thought this looked like the Flames of, of, you know, old, where they were playing to their opponent and not playing their game. And I thought... You know, it looked like last year's or the year before's flame saying, okay, we have a crappy team coming in. We're going to play a crappy game. Yeah, but Vancouver just had no life whatsoever. And, like, even just the fundamentals, like, the Flames started directing shots towards the net. And, like, even if they weren't hitting the net or they were getting blocked or whatever, like, it, I think it was at one point, like, 75 to 20 for the, you know, uh, attempted shots and it's like they were basically showing up even though like not their best effort and Vancouver though like all of their skaters were bad like I don't think any one of them had a decent or good night um it, see, it was a very bad effort by them, frankly. See, and I, and I saw it a little bit differently from where I was. Um, I thought the Vancouver actually had the better scoring chances after two periods. I thought they put more pressure on Markstrom than maybe we put on their goaltender. I didn't think the Flames were doing a really good job either. Um, and, you know, the Flames didn't capitalize on a lot of the power play time they needed to, especially that five minute in the first. Like, they got, I think, one shot the entire power play. Yeah, that was bad. Um, and, like, that's where, like, the sloppiness came in. Like, they were just not prepared at times I don't, times I don't think those. that they came... I don't even... I wouldn't even say, for me, they were the better team. I think that they were... I think, you know, we're seeing the depth of their roster compared to the depth of Vancouver's. That Calgary can play a lackluster game and, you know, you know still keep it in the realm of... Of, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Of, of okay. Yeah. Um, I thought there's and, a good. I thought there's a good game for Rujitska though. Yeah. Uh, to me, frankly, with Rujitska, I do not believe that he is coming out of the lineup again. I think he has earned his way on as because frankly, he's been the best of like the third, fourth line 
ish guys like uh, Pitlick, uh, Richardson, Richie, like of that group, he's been the best of. Well, let's come back to that. Let's wrap up this week and then let's talk a little bit more about Rajishka. Um, yeah. Matt they, Alton- actually, they actually won a game in overtime, which to me, like, that's a win. And that's, that's not how I expected this game to go. And I said to Ryan Pike, who I sit next to in the press box, I said, this feels like a night that we're going to get a long shootout. Yeah. We, and uh, shooter 17. I actually Calgary. looked it up. The longest shootout is 20 shots. 20, sorry, 20 rounds. That'd be uh, 39 or 40 shooters. Yeah. It's so, like looping on to the backup goaltenders. <laughs> like, I, I was just not expecting, you know, Johnny to score as quickly did. He was obviously sick of this game like the rest of us. Yeah. Just walks um, in, blasts it. Yeah, okay, good. Good night. And with this one, jo- um, Jacob Markstrom now has seven shutouts in the first 40 games of the season. Yeah. I think that the Flames record is 15, which was set by Mika Kiprasov. So, I mean, you know, halfway through, he could definitely uh, surpass that. Um, Actually, 15 is the NHL record. I think Kipper's at 11. Is um, he? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Esposito with the Blackhawks in 67. And um, the St. Louis Blues had uh, equaled it a few years ago. 67. How many... How many games? Yeah, I don't know. We'd have to look at that, too, and say, well, how many games they play back then? But, yeah. The uh, same amount, 82. Okay. Kippersoff has 10. I just looked it up. So, um, yeah. in 05 06, he got 10. In 06 07, he got 7. And in uh, 10 11, he got 6. So, Markstrom has tied him for, I guess, second in his own record and is uh, three away from, from the franchise record. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that uh, the Flames have been playing such stingy defense that, uh, like, if uh, the opponents are not very good, like, they're able to just shut them right down. And, like, Columbus has been bad this season, and Vancouver, um, like, they're dealing with a whole bunch of issues, and uh, the Flames just easily were able to shut the door on that. Just for the sake of sort of finishing up this game, Johnny Goudreau scores the only goal in the game winner 30 seconds into the overtime. People were barely even probably back at their couch ready to go, and Johnny ended this one. So not a great game overall, but you know what? Every season you're going to have games like this, and I'm glad this one's over. The first meeting of the team of these two teams for this year. Hopefully the next one will be more interesting. Yeah, well, two points is two points. Yep. It, 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 it wasn't pretty, but hey... At the end of the day, that's literally the only thing that matters. So just throw the tape out on that one. Um, that didn't happen. Get ready for Dallas. And, you know. They spent three hours playing the game, and they were right back where they started at 0-0. Yeah. Like, it, it was just bad. <laughs> And after those three games this week, the Calgary Flames now sit fourth in the Pacific Division at 48 points. They are seven games back from the most games played in the division, which is Anaheim. So the teams above us are L.A. at 53, Anaheim at 54 points, and Vegas at 55 points. And uh, Vegas has 45 games, Anaheim has 45 games, L.A. has 46. So as you've said in the past, Matt, you know, not a fair comparison, really. I mean, we look at San Jose, who's played 45, and they are one point less than us. So by the time we catch up, I expect the Flames to move from fourth higher than that. Yeah, like, frankly, they should be second unless the wheels go off the wagon a bit. And, you know, um, that game against Vegas, not next week, but the week after, uh, that might actually be a pivotal game in terms of being able to leapfrog at the same, like, 45-game mark. next yeah. home game, February 9th. Yeah. You were mentioning earlier Adam Rajichka staying in the lineup, and let's let's talk about that. So Adam Rajichka was a midseason call up. He was put in the lineup as the fourth line center. I think he's been looking good there, and I'd have no problem keeping him in the lineup. But that would give when Tyler Pitlick is healthy, that gives you one too many players in the roster. So what roster move would you make to keep Rajichka? Um, pick I th- one. I honestly, frankly, Brad Richardson or Trevor Lewis would be the guy that would go uh onto the taxi squad throw them on waivers no one's gonna claim them 
I think they want to. Yeah, that's true. I, I guess they'd want to keep him around, and I don't think we're. I don't think we have a taxi squad after the after the All Star game. The tax squads go away then. The only reason I don't think it could be Richardson is I think that they want him. I think the Flames like him in the room. I think that he's uh, he's yeah. been a, a good veteran guy. So I don't think, even if they waive him, they couldn't keep him around if there's no taxi squad. I think Sutter wants to keep Lewis here. I think really their only option would be to waive Pitlick, which really then, if he were to get claimed, and I could see Tyler Pitlick potentially get claimed, that's really a waste of the asset to bring him in. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, we and paid, what, a third for Pitlick? Fourth. Oh, right. The uh, third for, for Vladar. Yeah. And Zadorov. Yeah. So it, it's one of those things that uh, Pitlick has not really been the player that he has been. Like, um, he was very much like a... Like, you would be able to tell on the ice, like, he would be doing, like, all the little things to help your team succeed. And, like, frankly, we just haven't seen that level of detail from him. Um, you know, like, he's a very good two-way depth guy. And, like, we just have not seen any offense or defense, frankly, from Pitlick this year. Which, you know, if he continues to play like this, like, his stay in the NHL will be very short moving forward like he needs to pick it up in order to salvage a career even beyond this season because like he has been legitimately bad uh but it, it's one of those where it's hard to get rid of him both because of the cost to acquire him but also the net benefit if he does figure it out you know like he would be the best of the four guys that are that kind of third fourth line tweener and one year 1.75 million i can see some team potentially taking a flyer on him on waivers yeah um i don't disagree with you that it should probably be brad richardson but i think that the flames want that veteran presence in the dressing room which is why they brought him in and if there's no taxi squad he'd have to report to stockton um and i trevor lewis would be my second choice but i think that daryl sutter is too high on trevor lewis for it to be him yeah, it it really is just one of those where, like, I think that, like, in the coming weeks, um, regardless, I think it, the Flames are likely going to have to add a player or two at the deadline up front just to get some finishing ability. And uh, I think that, like, those roster spots that are currently occupied by that quartet are going to have to be vacated for the new guys to come in as it's well. It's going to depend when that move's made, though, because after the deadline, there is no upper limit to the roster size. So you could just bring guys in and not have to get rid of anybody. True. But if that deal's made ahead of the March 21st trade deadline, then you only got a 23-man roster. Um I can't see them getting rid of Stone, who's their seventh defenseman. You want to carry at least one defenseman, one extra defenseman. So, yeah, I guess it comes which one of the veterans do you move out of the lineup. It's not going to be Richie. Again, I think, you know, Sutter likes Richie too much. I think Sutter likes Lewis too much. I think the only option is, like, I don't see where Pitlick fits when he comes back. Yeah. When I look at our lineup, I mean, where, where do you put Pitlick? on his return yeah it's Assum li literally a winger. yeah it's literally find a spot any spot in order for him to remain in the lineup you and, know i mean you'd you'd have to take lewis or richie out which i don't think the daryl sutter wants to do so like you know you're you're not taking dubay coleman or mangiapani out no and that's where it becomes a little difficult to, and it, it'd be different like if Rujitska was not playing well because uh, you just airlift him back to Stockton mm -hmm. and problem solved but he's actually looked like a quality fourth line guy with energy and he's actually contributing offensively which is something that can't really be said for everybody else on that in that quartet I think you may see Rajishka have to go to Stockton for a week just so they can make some roster move and then come back. But I think, let's say the you know end of season roster, if we look at the roster at the end of April, Rajishka will be back here. They'll try to get him back as soon as they can. I just think being the guy that can go down to Stockton without clearing waivers, 
they may have no choice but to send him down while they do something else. And, you know, clear a roster spot somehow. But I agree with you, Matt. I think it's... And it's interesting. I mean, we saw the opening day roster had Glenn Godden on it, sort of in that fourth line center spot. He's not the guy, but Ruzicka is. So I think it's it's interesting to see if they've maybe they had the wrong young center at the beginning, but that a young center is breaking into a very veteran laden roster. It's nice to see. Yeah, well, it's also different uh, just because like Godin is pretty much getting to the point where he's that like NHL tweener guy who's not quite good enough for the NHL but not bad enough to be in the A and you know they needed to see you know because I think he's basically done at the end of the year that um it you know is he worth like can he cut it in the NHL and his appearances no thus far anyway we'll talk a little bit later about Stockton he's doing well in Stockton and yeah I think his his upside may be a 13th forward or maybe a bottom line forward on a bad team, but I think he's probably destined to spend most of his career in the American League. And, you know, if if Daryl Sutter was not the coach here, I honestly don't feel like Trevor Lewis nor Brett Ritchie would be in the lineup, so we'd probably have at least one more roster spot then for maybe Rujicka and um, somebody else or Godin and somebody else, but I feel like with Daryl Sutter being the coach, Lewis and Richie aren't going anywhere. Yeah. You know, those are both very Daryl Sutter players. Oh, for sure. And, like, especially as we get closer to the end of the season. Like, you saw after Lewis got hit in that game, like, Richie was right there to knock Myers onto his butt and then start punching him while there. Yeah, and from all accounts, I mean, Daryl Sutter called Trevor Lewis himself to ask him if he'd come play in Calgary. So I think this was a guy that Daryl wanted us to bring in. Yeah, and that makes entire sense. While we're talking about players who may or may not be on this roster uh, at the end of the season, I don't want to go too far down the trade rumor rabbit hole because we're still a ways out, but we're less than two months away from the trade deadline. And, I mean, you have your own thoughts of guys we bring in. I have my own thoughts. We'll save those for later. But this week, Elliot Friedman, a fairly reputable source, linked three names to the Calgary Flames. So I'll go through them all, Matt. Let's then talk about each guy one at a time, if we think it's a good signing and what the asking price might be and if we'd want to pay that. Yeah. First first one is JT Miller from Vancouver. Second one, Car- Connor Garland from Vancouver. And third one, defenseman Ben Sherratt from Montreal. So let's start with JT Miller. 28-year-old left shot with another year on his contract after this and a $5.25 million cap hit. You'd have to move some money out to make that work. What do you think about the idea of the Flames get, going out for JT Miller? Oh, well, frankly, like uh, that would be like trade target number one um, for what would be available on the market. And the Flames really could use a second option beyond uh, Lindholm who can create offense and play defensively well, which wasn't really, you know, showcased too well in the game yesterday, especially with the final goal being kind of his fault. But um, Miller would be, like, priority number one if we're, we're able to get him. Miller is right now playing on the top left wing position for the Canucks. If he comes here, you got to imagine he'd be on the second line. It'd probably be Backlund, Mangiapane, Miller. Yeah, or uh, some variation or there in Coleman, Mont- Miller, Backlund. Yeah, or like uh, Miller, Monahan, and Mangiapane. Make it the new 3M line. You could do that too, yeah. Um, for $5.25 million with one year left, you're going to need to move some salary out. What do you think the Flames package to bring in Miller could look like? Well, uh, for this season, I think you would just have to have Zadorov in the trade one way or another. And... You'd have to pay Vancouver to take him, I think. Oh, um, Zadorov only has, like, this year left, so it would literally be a cap here, take, you know, the his money, so that way we can afford this, or, you know, you eat part of the contract, or both. So Zadorov's in there. What else would you do you think would be a reasonable give for Miller? Um, 
Well, obviously draft picks just because like they're not really a part of your organization until you you're standing at the podium to select them. And I think yeah. Vancouver's going to want at least a roster player and maybe a prospect. Yeah, and that's where it gets a little dicey cuz like you wouldn't want to send say Dylan Dubé in that deal. I don't know about that. I uh... I personally think that Dubé has stalled his development a little bit. I think if we look at the current roster makeup of this team, Dylan's not going to be much more than a third liner on the current makeup of this team. What would you think if the Flames were to offer a first in Dubé? Um, I don't want to give up the first, but to get a guy like Miller, where I think there's going to be some competition in the market, I think that might I would I'd rather give up a second, but I think. The asking price is going to be a first in something. Yeah, and it, it it's tough. Like whether it's him or Connor Garland, um, like guys with term, it's always more difficult. And it seems that like the returns aren't quite as illustrious otherwise. And yeah, it it'll be interesting to see how that breaks down. Like I'm sure that Miller is going to be the number one trade target for basically anybody in a playoff spot. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Like uh, Calgary needs to find some method of getting finishing talent on the top six and top nine. Uh, cause like if basically if Kachuk and Gaudreau are not performing that night, you're basically done. My issue with JT Miller, I'm not opposed to the flames going for him, but I'm not sure another left winger is what we need. I think that if it was me looking at sort of what I'd be willing to pay, what the flames have and, um, you know, what the return I think on the ice would be, I would much rather go for his teammate, right winger, 25 year old, less, um, you know, less money, younger player, Connor Garland. The only downside to Garland is he's 25 and he has a five, let's call it rounded up to $5 million deal until 25, 26. So you'd have to be willing to move some money out. I think with JT Miller, you could make the money work if you need to, um, for this year and next year, Garland would be harder to take, but I feel like Garland, you could definitely get Garland. I think for first in Dubé. Yeah. Friend of the show and uh, co-host in the past, um, Mike Gold, who we've had on in the past. Mike has actually suggested uh, on Twitter, first, Dubé and Peltier. And I think that's too much for TJ Miller. Yeah, and... Or JT like, uh, Miller, uh, Honestly, like, if that was, like, the ask, like, um, the other guy, um, Connor Garland would have to be included in that as well like you know if you're throwing that level of assets in like it's not a one piece coming here like we no. need i'd be okay if there's one piece coming who we knew we had the cost certainty for a long time but i just i don't think that jt miller is that guy to mortgage the flames i think their cupboards are already bare especially on the forward side and to mortgage the best piece we have for a guy with one year on his deal I think that's that's a bad move. I also wonder, is Miller looking good because Miller's on a bad team, or is Miller looking is Miller looking you know good because he's a good player? And sometimes it's hard to tell. I mean, when he was in Tampa, he had when he was with the Rangers, he had a fifty six point season. He had a forty point season with the Rangers as well. He had a forty seven point season with the Lightning, seventy two point season in Vancouver. I think that's his anomaly year. And then 46 and 44, but I just, I don't know. I don't know this guy comes in as your second line left winger and the, the acquisition cost makes sense. I think he's going to be one of the most sought after wingers. So I think we're going to have to pay a high price. Yeah. And like, that's where like, I'm kind of less interested in the flames going out and acquiring the big shiny t toy. Like they have enough finish with most of the guys that they already have it's just they need a little boost and like if they can acquire some guys uh you know um that are fitting that mold of being the quality second third line guy who can chip in a little bit i think they'll have just as much impact as going and signing or acquiring miller or anybody equivalent where it's like a top line guy like it it, it we have our top line. We don't need to bring in a top line guy on the second line. 
Yeah, like that's why like uh, complimentary players uh, like Garland or you know like past guys we've uh, heard linked to like Tyler Toffoli, like that level and class of guys is more in keeping with like what the Flames actually need, not like the premier go to guys. Well, I'm coming into the season. You and I had said this team is short on right wingers. Connor Garland is a right shot right winger. Like to me, he fits more the mold the flames are looking for he's younger he's 25 they'd be bringing in a big contract so you'd have to make a hockey move but i think i think that i would rather just for the cost of acquisition bring in garland because like you said he's a middle six player and we need middle six wingers we don't need someone to replace johnny lindholm or kachuk right now we need somebody to complement our middle six i think you know uh, Monjapani garland monahan second line would be a great second line for this team. Can't argue with that. Having Garland there. So, Matt, I mean, what what do you give up for Garland? What do you think is a reasonable package? The Canucks are building for the future. Uh, Probably a first plus something small. Something small being a prospect, a roster player. What do you think that would look like? Um, Anything that Vancouver seems okay with. Like, I, I would not go... Like uh, a first plus Peltier it would be like we're gonna some need to clear other... some money to bring him in. Yeah, of course, and like you know, like that's where like I think Zadorov or a good Branson, one way or another, is going to be gone at the trade deadline if the Flames are busy, just because of that. So what if the package was a first Zadorov to clear money and Dubé? Because I think Vancouver could use the twenty-three-year-old winger. Do you think that's a good return? Oh uh, yeah. Um I know you like Dylan and I like Dylan too, but I just I don't yeah, know that I, I think at some point you gotta give to get. Yeah, it's one of those things that because Garland is young er um that doing it that way makes more sense. Like I I would not want to lose Dubé for like a thirty, thirty five year old guy. No, but trading twenty three year old Dubé for twenty five year old Garland I think makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and Garland also, I mean, at four, at four point nine five million, his cost for that role in the team would sort of be in line with the rest of our secondary players. I mean, he'd be making about the same as Coleman, um, you know, more than Lindholm. But Lindholm, we got a good deal on. Like I think his cost, while longer term, at least you know you have that certainty with that deal. So. I, I personally like the Garland deal better. And for the cost of acquisition, what we're getting out of it, like you said, we're not trying to get, you know, 60, 70, 80 points out of this deal. We're trying to get a complimentary player. And I think Garland is that complimentary guy if we want to make a deal with Vancouver. Yeah. And like, there are plenty of guys around the various teams that are going to be rebuilding that are in that generic mold. And I think that, like, frankly, the imperative thing is that after the deadline's over that the Flames have at least one or two higher-end guys somewhere in the organization. Um, Just because, like, if you look back to, like, the last time the Flames had as deep of holes as they did now, um, you have to go all the way back to 0304. And what Daryl did was made a handful of trades to get some depth guys and they ended up going all the way to the finals due to both of those things. And, like, I, I think that Calgary definitely has more flexibility uh, to pick and choose their battles, so to speak, and get the things that they need without too much worry. I'm looking here sort of at our, our prospect pieces. And when I'm looking at, I mean, saleable assets, uh, Matthias Amelio Pedersen, everyone's got one of them. We're not going to trade Zari. We're not going to trade Peltier. I think everybody's got a Walker Dewar. Everybody's got a Tulola. Everyone's got a Pospisil. Everyone's got a Zavgarani. These guys are sort of middle-of-the-road prospects that everybody has enough of in their system. You're not going to get any value for those things. The only other piece... You know that's not currently in the NHL, if you will, is Valimaki. But I think if you start offering Dubé and Valimaki and a first, you're overpaying. Yeah, and and, like, and I think you know, the honestly, plan is to like have if, Valimaki in the NHL next year. Yeah, like honestly, if you're uh, spending that much, like you're gonna want like a really dynamite movie uh, to take its place. Like it's yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I I can't see. I I think a first is a little rich for Garland, but I think it could be the asking price. I'm right now they're saying there's four teams in on him, so I think we may have to give up a first. But we have two seconds this year. We have our our own second and our second that we got in the Bennett trade. So I, we have no third, no fourth, no sixth. Like I, I don't want to lose another draft pick, which is a very true living thing to do. But I could honestly see the Flames with two seconds offering a second in Dubé. Maybe even a second in something next year. I just, I don't want to get, like, our, our cupboards are so bare and we're not yet a top contender in the league. I don't want us to keep having no draft picks because that's going to stunt our, our team growth. I don't know what the solution is. No, oh, um, I think the Flames just need to, like, throw a little bit of caution to the wind and just do and deal with lack of uh you know everything I, later I think, I think you do that if you think it's your year but i'm not convinced it's their year well and that's where like um because gaudreau and uh kachuk are free-ish agents uh when uh you know like it's uh, sort of like Columbus a few years ago when they went all in and like they had Panarin and Bobrovsky both expiring and they're like, well, to hell with it. We're just going to go all in, get to, to Zingle and um, Duchesne in order to try and go for it that year. And it didn't work out for them, but I think the Flames are in the same spot where because of the ambiguity with Gaudreau, that, you know, as you said, it might not necessarily be their year, but I think that this might be the best of what they can can do, and so might as well throw caution to the wind. Because, well, like, and, yeah. And you were mentioning, you know, ambiguity with Gaudreau. I think before you make any of these deals, you have to have some idea of both Gaudreau and Kachuk's status and if they'd be coming back. If not, I think then you've got an even bigger piece to play with, and if neither of those guys are coming back... I think one of them has to be like, let's say they're both not coming back. I think at least one of them has to go at the deadline to get a long-term piece in return. Yeah. And I don't would... think we're close enough where you keep them both for a Stanley cup run. And uh, that's where I beg to differ. Um, because of how they fundamentally play the game, like the two games this week with uh, Columbus and Vancouver, um, they're very much a team that is built for the postseason and like uh that very much rough and tumble type game and i i think that uh especially with the playoffs the flames are better suited than some to be successful in the postseason so i disagree but i think what you would get for johnny johnny's the ufa i mean let's take um kachuk off the table for a sec because he's rfa it's not like you're going to trade Johnny for a fourth. I think whatever you would get for Johnny, you could still have your, your core intact around that. Well, and that's the thing. Like, um, the New York Islanders lost to Varus a handful of years ago, and they got better because of it. Um, it like, the Flames, like, yeah, they're, they'd be losing out on Gaudreau and not necessarily getting anything in return. But, you know, cap space is a thing. Um, like, the difference between like a seven million dollar free agent and what Gaudreau is is not that drastic. So you know, like the Flames could basically make like Kachuk the premier guy on the team next year if Gaudreau has to leave, and shake everything out from there. Yeah, and we'll I mean we'll talk more about that as we get close to the deadline, but I think before you make any of these deals, you have to have some idea of who's coming back and who's not because if Gaudreau's not coming back, then JT Miller makes a little more sense to fill that sort of number 1 left wing role next year. You bring him in as a second line guy and maybe he fills that role next year. If Gaudreau's not coming back or if Gaudreau is coming back, I think that Garland makes more sense. So I think True Living has to have some idea of what they're doing with this lineup next year before he goes and, and deals for anything, you know, more than depth pieces. Yeah. And that's where, you know, like we're basically outsiders looking in and, uh, you know, it, it's one of those where you just have to wait and see. 
The other player that the Flames have been linked to, according to Elliot Friedman, is a uh, 30-year-old defenseman, six foot three, two hundred and thirty-four pound left-handed defender Ben Sherratt out of Montreal. He's a pending UFA this year. He's in the last year of a three point five million dollar contract he signed back in in 2019 with Montreal. And again, I wouldn't be opposed to Sherratt coming in, but as a 30-year-old and looking at our blue line depth, I don't think that's a guy you would bring back next year. So the question is, how cheap could you get Sherratt from Montreal as well, a rental? Well, I think that like with most of these guys, like it's either going to be a high first like in the top 10 or so picks of the second round and a uh, top prospect from this team uh, if you're going to go that route. So let's so let's play that game then with Sherratt. It, do you think if they brought in Ben Sherratt, could you see him being on the team next year? Yeah. It, it's just that, uh, yeah, it would not be the ideal situation. So, it, so, I mean, you know, I personally can't. I think the Flames have enough. I think that Zadorov's going to be gone. I think Valimaki's going to fill that spot. Maybe Good Branson comes back. If not, I think somebody else will fill that spot cheaper. I don't think that they're going to get Sherratt for the money they'd want to pay. So as a rental, I'm not willing to pay more than a fourth for Sherratt. And I don't think it'll. I don't think he'll go for a fourth. What do you? Th- what do you? What would you pay? Let's. You think Sherratt could be back next year? So with that in mind. What would you be willing to pay for Ben Sherratt? Well, would you pay the second? Do you think it's going to take? Yeah, it, it's one of those things that uh, it depends largely on what um, and how you feel about Sherratt. Like if, like in a vacuum, if he's like a good uh, four, five, six guy in and of his own, then the second round pick is definitely warranted. And you know, if he's not, then you know, like there are other options out there. Let's just put it this way: Sherratt's a UFA at the end of the year. What would you be willing to pay to get him? You you think the Flames are poised to go deep this year? Do you think you need Ben Sherratt on our blue line? And is it going to make any substantial difference this year, or is that a guy you talk to July first? Uh, a little bit of A, a little bit of B. I I wouldn't spend more than a fourth round pick, frankly, for Sherratt. I'm not saying Sherrod couldn't be here. I just don't think that he's a guy you need this year. I think that we could find cheaper options to shore up the blue line if that's what we want to do. And I, I and I don't think Sherrod would go for a fourth. I think somebody would pay a second or a third. Yeah, and... And I wouldn't. No, and that's where, like, Calgary would need to do their due diligence and see, like, if plan A being Sherrod falls through... Is there a viable alternate? And Fred Kulak. That's actually one of the names that I was going to bandy about. But yeah, it, it's it'll be interesting to see. Frankly, like this team can and, do. And, and like, I think ha- it's a reminder to fans too. We're going to hear Calgary's in on a lot of stuff because our general manager is known to always be kicking tires. So just yeah. because they're kicking the tires doesn't mean we're close. But I think we're going to hear from now to the end, especially with the Flames thinking that they've got something. I think we're going to hear that we're in on a, or we're in, you know, talking to teams about a lot. Well, and like that's where like Calgary's lack of real need for like going uh, big game hunting right now. Like we don't need a Gaudreau caliber guy who's a UFA. Like we can get around by like getting quality middle six forwards uh second or third pairing defensemen and like there are plenty of them in the teams that are out of a playoff spot so it's like you're not necessarily needing to be beholden to get one specific guy just because he's there the flames of two second round picks this year at right now i would not be surprised if after the deadline we don't have either of them but if we're going to spend one of those, I don't want to spend it on Ben Chirot. Yeah. I, I can agree. think of better things to shore up this team with and use those assets to get real value out of than Ben Chirot. I agree. I mean, if you just want a different defenseman there, I would say put Valimaki in before spending that on Ben Chirot. 
Like if it's just if the idea is to get Zadorov out of the lineup, we've got Stone, we've got Valimaki. Like I think there's other ways to achieve that without paying a, a high acquisition cost for 30 year old Ben Sherratt. Yeah, and that's where like some of the retread guys uh, like Toffoli or like Gustav Nyquist or you know some of Vancouver's and those are guys, guys I would rather spend the second plus something on. Yeah, exactly, and we'll see. Like it, it we're still too far out partially, and like what and where Calgary is is still undefined. So until like some of those questions start getting answered, you know it, it's tough. And I think Tree's gonna want to do something early, but I don't think this early. And I think. I think the Flames know that they're probably playoff poised this year. So if you can beat the market and go to get a deal, great. But I also don't want to establish market prices in a lot of ways. Because often the teams establish market prices overpay. So I, I don't see any big deal like this coming down before March 1st. Do you, Matt? No. And it, it, like this is prime time to go shopping. And if there is a timeline on player X, well then either go for it or don't but you know it right now i also feel like there's a lot of other fringe teams that would be more desperate to pay a higher price for those guys like if there's a timeline i think you're gonna see somebody else get them because they have more assets they're willing to part with yeah moving away from the calgary flames let's talk a little bit about the stockton heat we haven't talked a lot about them this this year um stockton heat having one of their i think probably their best season as a franchise so far in uh 35 games played they have 24 wins seven losses three overtime losses and one shootout loss for 52 points which puts them at the top of the pacific division really good year for this team i don't know if it's just uh mitch love coming on as coach or a bunch of things but they're really riding that wave. And if you think that they've got 35 games under their belt now, Matthew Phillips and uh, Peltier both have 33 points. God ends at 32. So three guys who are almost point-per-game players. Like, that's that's an impressive number. That's what, yeah. 0.75 points a game for two of those guys? So... Yeah, I mean, that's a good number. Everybody here's the lowest number of points on the team, you know, that are Flames prospects, I guess, would be um, mostly the, the defenseman. Pedersen's got eight. He's kind of lowest forward that's a Flames prospect. Um, Valimaki's even got seven. He's been there for not all season. Um, but, yeah, really looking good this year. And we talked last week about, you know, who should the Flames bring up? When should they bring a guy up? I think, and, and tell me if you think differently, Matt, but I think when your farm team is doing well, you're even more hesitant to move a guy to the NHL because you want your farm team to be successful. You want those guys to taste that, you know, Calder trophy victory. And if you start shuffling guys up just to try new guys in the NHL, if you bring Pelte up just because, you're you're going to wreck that chemistry. And I think when your team's doing well, like Stockton is, I w- if I was the GM, I'd have more he- hesitancy to start bringing guys up. I mean, you could probably bring up, you know, Gravel and Walensky and guys like that, and it's not going to matter much if you just need a plugger. Yeah, well, like, that's where, uh, you know, it, it's different because of the fact that, like, a guy like Ruzitska has played well. Mm-hmm. And Peltier, frankly, is playing well. Um, I think and... if you're willing to bring them up and keep them up, like Ruzitska, it's different. Yeah, and I think that's where, like, if you're going to tap that well, you're going to have to, you know, see if, like, Peltier can play. Because, like, frankly, like, Peltier's more, his style of game is more suited to being able to play up and down the lineup. Um, Like, he could play on the fourth line with Ruzitska and be perfectly fine there. Yeah, but I think he's he's doing more value to his development by playing first line minutes for a hot Heat team. Oh, I agree. Uh, but it's one of those where, like, if you're kind of like building towards the Flames postseason, you could kind of like view that as like a quasi trade deadline acquisition in of itself. Um, where if you're like having him play. And if he is actually having some success, then, you know, you've got another depth scoring piece 
possibly for the playoffs as well. So I think if you're going to bring him up to middle six, sure. But if I'm looking to fill a line, a fourth line spot, like you were saying, I think I'd call up a Byron Ferrosi before I'd call up, you know, Peltier. Cause I think keeping him, keeping Phillips in their routine in Stockton is going to pay more dividends. Yeah, well, like, uh, Phillips, yeah, I can definitely, like, he needs to be in the top nine. And, you know, like, it, that's, to me, is a given. It's just that, um, for me, with uh, Peltier, I think that if you're going to recall him, you know, like, because he is playing well, mm-hmm. um, that and kind of showing that he's too good for the A, you know, giving him a taste, and like if, if he struggles, then you just send him back. Frankly, but if he, I just put, wonder how much that could disturb his year. Well, his and that, and that's the thing. Like, um, Peltier is a, a player that, frankly, should be a top nine, top six forward, at like when he's developed and all of that, and. I I think that like getting a taste of the NHL like say post deadline would be enough incentive for him to like oh I'm deficient in areas X Y and Z and let's work on it like if he gets pulled out of the lineup or if he doesn't get pulled out of the lineup then you know you've just got it you know a viable player because he wouldn't be in the lineup otherwise. I think you can get, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but as an AHL rookie, I think you're not so much looking at where's his NHL deficiency at this point. I think you can find a lot of that by looking at, say, an AHL playoff run. Yeah, I agree. Like if if Stockton was last place or out of the playoffs, sure. But to me, I'm thinking with Stockton being first in their division, I think there's maybe something to be said about leaving those guys down there to be the big fish in a small pond. I agree. It's just that... Um... Pelte is basically the only, like, young forward or defenseman mm-hmm. that, to me, is viable in the NHL right now. Like, and maybe I'm a little scared because I still think that they rushed Bennett to the league. I'd almost rather – I don't think you need Peltier this year. I'd almost rather leave him down there and bring him up when we have a spot than just bring him up because. Yeah. Well, to be fair to Peltier um, – he seems to be more disciplined overall than Bennett was, um, which was a lot of what led Bennett astray with, you know, just bad decision making. Um, we'll see. Like, it, it's one of those that, like, if the Flames recall him, then sure, that makes sense. If they don't, it's like, sure, that makes sense. So, but at least it's a viable option instead of, oh, we're just going to shoehorn this guy in here because, hey, that's the only farm guy we've got. And then the last piece of Stockton news is uh, playing his first game since January 9th because of injury. Yusuf Valamaki was back in the lineup uh, last night, which would be Sunday the 29th, against uh, the Ontario Reign, I think that's who they were playing, um, and was assessed a game misconduct for physical abuse of officials at the 3.05 mark of period three. The penalty carries an automatic three-game suspension. So I've seen clips of it. I haven't watched the whole game to see it in context, but when I'm thinking about guys down there that are you know going to get that penalty, Val and Mackey's not the guy that I'm thinking of. So... The, the first thing that came to my head is, wow, here's a guy who's passionate and is, I mean, you don't say you're passionate because, you're, you know, you're hitting the official, but I'm, you know, it looked like he was in there trying to, you know, help his teammate and, you know, get some things going. And uh, I'm hoping that's what it is. And I'm hoping this isn't a, you know, sort of a, a lack in character, because often we see guys that do that who will keep doing those kind of things and have those same lack of judgment in the NHL. And I think if they bring Valimaki up, I don't want him to be constantly having to go chat with George Peros, who's in charge of player safety. Did you see yeah. the clip, Matt? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. So, what will, if anybody watches the clip and has their own thoughts on it, feel free to let us know on Twitter, Facebook, anywhere, uh, what you think. Is this just sort of Valimaki in the heat of the moment? Do you think maybe Valley's... Um, I don't know, is he trying to change the way he plays to maybe get some more grit and doing it wrong? Let us know what you think. 
And Matt, I know something that you probably want to talk about here, and we'll use this our last uh, our last topic before we do our prediction game. Evander Kane finally has a home. It's not in Calgary as you predict it might be. He's up the QE2 in Edmonton. What do you what do you think about him landing in Edmonton? Well, frankly, it will help the Oilers a bit just because of the fact that Kane is a top nine forward, even with all the BS around him. So, you know, they added a good scoring piece. Whether or not that continues is yet to be seen. But, um, yeah. Like do, you think we'll, do you think we'll see him make a, a noticeable difference to the Oilers' end-of-season standings? Probably not. Because, like, the Oilers' problems are more than, like, one or two guys. Like, frankly, outside of uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl, like, the entire organization basically needs to get uh, a huge infusion of everything everywhere. Like, the, there's not one strength that that team has at any position. I, I look at this almost as an audition. I think if this works well for both sides, I could see Evander Kane potentially sign a longer-term deal there in the offseason. I think it's too late in the season right now for the Oilers to see a huge benefit from Kane, especially, like you said, with some of the other issues. But I think it's really a, a show-me contract, and the, the big question will be if Kane goes back. If Kane goes back, I think this could be a big piece for them. But I don't think Kane does a lot for 2021-2022. Yeah, and I can see that. It's just... Um, it's hard to tell, frankly. Like, uh, Are you but, surprised Edmonton's where he, where he ended up? Not really. Like, frankly, Edmonton's a bit of a tire fire in their own right. Just with, like, attitudes of players and fans and actual results not meshing in any way shape or form the fact that he went to Edmonton to me makes me wonder how many other teams were actually in on him like if I'm a if I'm a player and I had almost any other team interested in me I'd probably take it unless he thinks Edmonton's going to give him the best you know look this season because he'll probably be on the first line there but I think with any other team I probably would have taken the contract so it really made me wonder who was actually in on this who actually put you know a contract in front of him yeah, probably just Edmonton. Like, uh, um, it, it's hard when you know, like he's a universally hated player by you know opponents and teammates alike. So we'll see. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I just. I'm not surprised he went to Edmonton because, again, I think they're looking for a quick way to try and improve their roster, and he can do that for you. But I'm – if I was – I shouldn't say if I was Vander Kane. If I was Vander Kane's agent, I probably would have suggested taking almost any other contract unless you really want to say, look, this guy is a top-line guy. Edmonton will play him on the top line where someone else might have brought him in as a middle six – bottom six players so we're going to take Edmonton as the best opportunity yeah but I think if you really want to show them off you'd be much better doing a lot of other markets well when's the last time that the others did things that made sense anyway well I, I don't know I mean we I don't want to go too far down the Oilers rabbit hole but I thought that bringing Kenny Holland in as their GM was a good move I thought Tippett as coach was a good move like I've thought in the past couple of years they've been bringing in the right personnel but I think you can only undo garbage for so long and the Oilers have no assets to give up to get better so you know to me I think that they're doing the best they can um, to to try and get better but I think you know when you've got no assets sort of like we were talking earlier like what non-NHL asset do the Flames have to give up they're running short on those so I think when you have no asset to move, there's only so much you can do. So trying to get a player from outside the organization like Evander Kane is really all you can do. I thought Duncan Keith made sense for their team as well. Like you're saying, when was the last time they did something that made sense? Would I have done it for the Flames? No, but I thought it made sense for where the Oilers are. Well, that about wraps up what we have to talk about with the Flames this week. So, Matt, the only other thing we've got to do is make our predictions. And if we take a look back at last week, 
we both lost. Uh, you thought that we would win against Columbus and Vancouver, lose against um, – or no, you, you did predict it right. You thought Columbus, Vancouver, and we lose Seattle. I thought we'd win Seattle – or sorry, not Seattle, St. Louis. I've got the wrong letters in my spreadsheet here. And I thought we'd win St. Louis and Vancouver, lose Columbus. So you got you got two um, now this season. So you predicted last week correctly with a win against Columbus and Vancouver and a loss to, to St. Louis. So let's talk about this week. Two games on the Flames' schedule. Uh, it's a short road trip, a Dallas-Arizona road trip. Then the Flames have six days off. They're off the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth for the All-Star break. And so only two games this week. Um, a road game on Tuesday, 6.30 start time against Dallas. And a road game at Arizona Wednesday, 7.30 start time against the um, against the. Coyotes, Matt. What are your predictions? Um. Well, frankly, Dallas and Arizona both suck compared to well, Dallas more so. Um, compared to their usual, um, Arizona's just bad all the way around. So, frankly, the Flames should go out and get four points. Whether or not that's the case yet to be seen, but if they're gonna get, um. Is that what you're predicting? Yeah, like they really should beat both. Like, like there's not really like Dallas gives the Flames a hard time, but they need to be able to put them away. And that's why I'm going to go a little bit different. I'm going to go win Arizona. I mean, Arizona's given us a hard time too, but I'm going to say we win Arizona and lose Dallas just because the Stars seem to be our kryptonite the last couple of seasons. Yeah. No matter how good or bad they are, and from what I can remember, they're not like one nothing games. We've had some some large losses to the Stars. Yeah. I, I know both Sagan and Ben tend to step up their game on those games for whatever Is reason. Is Bishop still there in net? Uh, no, he retired. Okay. So yeah, he was always uh, he was always a pain in our butt too. Yeah. All right, so you're going with uh, four points this week. And, Matt, will you be watching the – well, let, let me – before I get there, um, Daryl Sutter had mentioned in our last back-to-back that they played Markstrom both nights because Dan Vladar didn't look good when he played a month ago. But at some point, you've got to get him going again. Do you play him in one of these games? I think the Arizona games Taylor made for Vladar to start. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, I'd probably do the same. Um I could see a scenario if he was hotter where you might even give Ladar both. Yeah. But he's he's struggling his last outing and but I think again you gotta get him going again. They've got three sets of back to backs this month. So I think yeah, Arizona's the game for him. Yeah. And then we have the All Star break. Will you be watching the All Star game? No. Very definitive. Me neither. No, I have no interest this year. Um, we've talked about the All Star Game in the past, so we won't dwell on it again. But I, I may have it on in the background while I'm doing something, but I won't be sitting down to pay attention to the game. Well, that about wraps us up for this week. Um, we hope everybody enjoys this short road trip, and then we've got the Flames at home pretty much all month. So these are the last couple of games on the road, and then. Uh, a huge homestand for this team. So if you want to see the team play, this is probably the best time to get some tickets. I'm sure those tickets will be readily available. Um, I know there's a lot of influx right now. So grab your tickets, head to the Dome, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight games this month that you might be able to see at the Dome. So uh, enjoy those games, and we will talk to everybody next week as we continue our Sunday recording schedule. Yeah, so as always, uh, just... Go Flames, go. Like, this team, they're on a bit of a roll, and they just need to show that they can keep going. They just need to keep playing like they are. Yeah. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.